So, so you know, one, I wanted to thank Verite for coming to, uh, to Munich. Uh, it's your first time here, right? First time here. First time here. And when Steffi was asking uh, what I wanted to talk about and who I wanted to talk to, um, one of the first people I thought about was you. And, um, you know, one, I think this morning for anybody who heard the performance, um, just an amazing artist that with mesmerizing music. And, um, you know, so, you know, I'm personally a fan and my team are big fans, but when you and I had dinner, um, uh, our community dinner at the house a couple months back, I just walked away just blown away just by the way you thought about things. And it was very congruent with um, some of the ways that, you know, what we've been thinking about. So with um, this talk specifically, one of the things that has come up is just this whole idea around the mispricing of music. And, you know, and as you can see, just kind of looking at, you know, um, Spotify's offer for three months for 99 cents, um, uh, Apple's family plan, $14.99 a month, uh, up to six people, which is like $1.50 per person. <laughs> um, looking at Amazon Music's and titles, you know, um, the value of music um, has just, I don't think from an art form, it's been, um, it's been respected and it's not been upheld like other art forms. And if you go to the next slide, you can actually see, um, like artists can't name their price, but these guys can. So Domino's Pizza, that, pe I guess you call it a delicious looking pizza. <laughs> uh, thank you, for 10 bucks. Um, the, the Ryan Reynolds movie, $14.99, and three virtual masks on Roblox cost $87.50. You know, and at the same time, you're looking at when musicians get paid, and because of the way these deals are structured between the larger labels and the streaming companies, artists can't name their price. So they're stuck behind this wall of, um, you know, a little less than four tenths of a cent per stream. And, um, and then when we look at other forms of, of art, you know, just this past week, we saw um, uh, this auction record being broken for Andy Warhol for $195 million dollars. For, um, a Mar for the Marilyn Monroe painting here. And, you know, Bob Dylan sold his entire catalog, almost 50 years worth of work, for $230 million. So when you look at, you know, whether it's Blowing in the Wind or it's just some of Bob Dylan's classic, classic songs, you know, when you think about the value of art, you know, is, is music not art and how are we valuing art? I think the music industry, for the most part, has given it away. Um, and another example is Springsteen. Um, you know, he sold his catalog for $550 million, but we see that this de Kooning painting just by itself is $300 million. You know, so, so when you think about this in the, turn, in, uh, in the lines of like rare assets, um, you know, and, and you think about what music does and the impact that it does, I just think, you know, it just ha is, is very, very undervalued. And, leading me to my conversation with somebody who decided to capture the value uh, in their music and determine where, where her music is worth, you know, um, this was the conversation that led me to, to this moment where I just was, my mind was blown, just the way you thought about things, the way you um, empowered yourself to sort of take control and not take this back seat and let the industry lead you, but you actually become a leader. So I guess um, before we get there, tell me your journey and, and how, how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first off, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I think from my perspective, I've been an independent artist for the last seven years, and I have had a good amount of success building something that I feel like is my own um, in terms of I own all of my music and my goal from a very early point in my career was to maintain creative autonomy in how I create music, how I distribute music, and how I can connect to people. And that worked really well within, um, you know, the technological innovations that were streaming. I was a really early adopter and embracer of the fact that, you know, streaming was a tool for enterprising independent artists to, um, you know, essentially build their own outside of traditional structures. 
And in 2020, pandemic hit, everybody was forced to look left and right. And, and when I did and kind of surveyed my career where it was at, um, I recognized that the tools and systems with which I had built my career upon, which was really on streaming and social media, like they weren't viable options for moving forward mostly because the marketplace had changed. It's like democratizing uh, creation and distribution of music has led us to a point where the marketplace is wholly oversaturated, um, which has forced kind of algorithmic gatekeepers to really come in and essentially cut us off from the audiences that we've spent years building. Um, so and it's sort of like Facebook when they started selling. Uh, you, you would build these audiences on Facebook and then all of a sudden you have to pay to reach the audiences? Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen that on literally every platform. And then we've seen even in streaming, those playlists are now owned by these major entities. So if you are independent, there's not necessarily um, a surefire way to kind of become involved um, without like a massive uh, digital advertising budget. And so it kind of pushed me into this world of, um, you know, Web3 and utilizing blockchain technology to essentially solve some of these problems. And I think I have a relatively, I, I think it's becoming more popular, but like, I think that music should be free at the baseline to experience. And because we're seeing it, the, the, you know, consumers, the people who, who love music, you know, they don't want to pay for discovery anymore. The second I could download a wide variety of music, I was on LimeWire downloading albums because I was so excited at the prospect to have choice. Um, I was no longer forced to, you know, save up for a $12 CD. And so why argue with the reality of things? Um, I, I'm a pragmatist at heart. And so essentially it's, but how can we experiment with tiers of value above free? And, and what do my fans and what does my community value? What type of... Uh, ownership opportunities, experiences, um, do they want to participate in? And so 2021, kind of moving into 2022, was really an experiment in how do I find out? Because I didn't know, and I, we were talking about this before, like value, like what is value? There's sentimental value, which is in inherently limitless, right? When I listen to a song, I have an emotional reaction. You can't really quantify that. But then there's value of how far is somebody willing to open up their wallet in order to, you know, purchase something in order to kind of provide some sort of compensation for a good service, art, etc. And so I've really just been playing with that back and forth. And, and can you, um, like, w I guess for those who don't know, um, explain Web3 and how it relates to music and, um, and sort of what was your entry point into it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my entry point was flying blind and I uh, got invited to a platform called Zora where they said you can upload a piece of your music and people will pay for it. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, maybe. Um, and really, I've kind of distilled three silos of like, value propositions that I see being the future, kind of through all of my experimentation. And, and one of those is, uh, you know, one of one music NFTs. The idea that, like, maybe we should be treating music more like fine art, and, and what the blockchain allows us to do is create digital scarcity in terms of ownership. So it's like something that everybody can stream for free, experience for free. Um, we're now able to have verified ownership uh, on chain. So you're creating um, a more bespoke experience for the owner, and I like to call it like it's like the Mona Lisa of, you know, music, for instance. So it's like you get the original print of this master verified, and so there are a lot of platforms that embrace that. Like Catalog uh, is is one of my favorites, and um, from there, it's also fractionalized ownership, and uh, that kind of takes the value proposition into the real world, which. A lot of the research that's starting to come out, it, we're seeing that fans and, and non-crypto native users really need a tie-in to IRL experiences to understand. And the gentleman was just up here talking about like gaming in the metaverse. The idea that like people want to have tangible experiences to understand new technologies. And I did that with Royal, where essentially I was able to set my own valuation. Um, and I did an early version of this experiment uh, before I knew how to do it legally with Royal, uh, because fractionalization is like iffy legal waters. 
Uh, and so essentially the idea that I can set my own valuation for a song and allow fans to participate at whatever price point they choose. Um, and this is not just them owning the music to listen to, this is them actually participating in the, in the royalties from it as well? Yeah, and, and I think what, what that does psychologically is it creates a different means of patronage where you create mutually aligned incentives between artists and their communities. And I was, you know, we all know, as you just said, streaming royalties are not, you know, the main drive, income drive anymore. Um, and I was very clear with my community as I was selling these tokens. Uh, but I view this as the next generation of a merch bundle, essentially, where you're getting a hoodie. Uh, in my case, you got a, a cassette tape with a voice memo for me and the song on the other side. You get an experience, you get private access to the Discord, um, you get to kind of open up the session of the song, and you're getting streaming royalties from that song, which isn't necessarily meaningful income, but at its grandest scale, if a song hits a billion streams, like th that could potentially be profitable, though I don't think it's necessarily um, in any artist's best interest to profit financial gain to their fans. And, and has, has this... Um sort of new relationship between you and, and your fans, ha has this strengthened the relationship? Is there a different relationship once there's sort of um, money involved? Yes and no. I mean, there's already money involved. And I think that that's, you know, being an independent artist, again, who's kind of built this career and really looked at it like I'm trying to build something that's going to sustain for 10, 15 years, it's like you're building a business. And so money is already exchanging hands, essentially, when a fan buys a merch bundle or a concert ticket. And so I, I don't necessarily like to um, focus fully on like how financialized it is and more so like what value can I create for these people that could potentially create value for themselves and then kind of feed back into that ecosystem. Well, I guess, the, like, where I was asking is, like, if they're already expecting a, a financial return. Yeah. I, so I had a town hall right before, and I was super clear. I was like, if you're not willing to part with $150, which is about what I price my, like, full-scale merch bundles at, where you get the hoodie, the T-shirt, that, the whole thing. Um, then you shouldn't participate. And I was very clear, because we are in a new world. Crypto is a highly volatile market. And I think that we're looking at a five-year on, like onboarding ramp for non-crypto native fans. And I think that that on-ramp needs to be handled with care, because more so than money, I'm concerned with my relationship with these people who have allowed me to create the art that I want to create and share it with them and be lucky enough to do that for a living for the last seven years. So it's like keeping the priority uh, extremely fan-focused and viewing this as an opportunity to play with new technology to create new experiences with these people. That's great. One of the things you said to me was um, you didn't think Web, th Web 3 doesn't solve all of the problems of Web 2. And you were the first person, and I've, I've talked to a million people in the Web 3 space, and you, you're the only person that articulated it that clear, and that, that was always my belief. Mm -hmm. But it was like, you know, I think everybody was like so overly excited about Web 3. And, um, and, and your approach to it was, was, was very grounded. Like, can you uh, just elaborate on that, that piece a little bit? Yeah, I feel like my pragmatism can bring the mood down sometimes, you know? <laughs> it's like everyone's really pumped, and I'm like, but wait, there's more. Um, and I think that inherently, I believe that in an artist-centric music industry, and I think that we are so far away from that, and artists don't feel empowered to be art artist-centric. Uh, labels, publishers, um, and, and the teams that surround artists are not also artist-centric, and I think what that involves is artists actually building their own capabilities to uh, really run their projects like a business, and if you are at if you are educated about the business that you're running, you're then able to bring on educated partners. You are then able to place yourself in a position of power within negotiations, et cetera. And I think that it's very easy to kind of, oh, there's all these new tools, there's these new platforms where if I put my NFTs up, they'll sell out, but like, 
if we're not bringing everything back to the core of this, which is the, the artist and fan relationship, me having access to the community that I'm building, and, and really focusing in on that, then we're just going to literally recreate the same problems, just with different technology on the back end. Well, one of the things that, um, like you, you, you're talking about getting back to like the principle, 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 I always talk about, um, like for me, one of the most important principles is, is the song, right? And um, with your process, um, as a writer, does like melody come first or lyric come first? Like, I would say that it all comes together at the same time, and I just kind of sit, and whatever comes out comes out, and then uh, so that's like the initial moment of inspiration, and from there it's like a puzzle, and you're just putting the pieces together. And quite frankly, everything that we're talking about on the business side is the same type of creative problem solving that we're doing on the creative side. We're just applying it to the overall architecture of the project. Amazing. And then one one last question: um, What is there? What what song? Is there a song that you wish you would have written? If it was one song. Oh, yeah. I, I cover all the songs I wish I had written. Which one? So, Which? 1975, Somebody Else, Childish Gambino, Sober, Sufjan Stevens, John, My Beloved. I just, if I wish I had written it and I get that feeling, I do a cover. And Amazing. They all go well, so, <laughs> you know. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming. And um, you guys should definitely check her out and ch uh, check out the music. Um, on streaming services or um, preferably buy one of the NFTs. Yes, thank you guys so <laughs> she much. She gets paid more. <laughs> oh, we did it. Thanks.